we're gonna service is gonna it's gonna flow a little different today. Uh, here in just a minute, we're gonna, uh, here shortly, we're gonna take communion on the front end of the sermon, and then uh, we're gonna just kind of talk out of that. But uh, if you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Luke chapter twenty-two, and uh, that's kind of where we're gonna be text-wise today. I'm gonna jump into John chapter thirteen also, but Luke twenty-two is gonna be the bulk of where I'm gonna be. I just want to talk a little bit about the weight or the importance of kind of where and what we're seeing God do. I don't know if that's me, but if it is, it'll stop in a second. So, um, so Jesus has been in alive for 30 years and he begins his, what we would call his adult ministry, this ministry that we know of that's found listed in the gospels. Three and a half years is what he gets on that ministry. Anybody here, um, anybody here 33, 34 years old? Hands up if you're 33, 34. Nick, put your hand down. You're not 33, 34. You're not even the flip of that 43, that 34. The, but that's the age Jesus got to. And, and it's, it's hard for me sometimes to put, to put together because, like, here's this guy 33 years old, and he's got the answers. Like, he's got the answers. He's got the remedy. He's got this. He's got that. And I'm sitting here at 48 years old still wondering sometimes how to get through the day. Can anybody relate? And so Jesus goes through this beautiful life of ministry and, and, and the struggles of, of humanity, and yet he gets to this moment where the Bible tells us, I think in John, it says, and Jesus now knowing that the Father had placed all things in his hands. In other words, hey, Jesus, we've come to the end of the road here. Jesus says, I want to get the guys together for one last Passover meal. It's come to us. And we call it the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. And he gets this room set aside and has it set aside for him and his team, his, his friends, to meet and he calls them into the room and he begins just kind of unloading on them the weight of what's happening. And we're in a series right now called That's My Church. And, and we've talked about how we're never finished. And we're, we've talked about um, how we refuse to be good. And today we're going to talk about the fact that we are, we are better together. You say, oh, we're going to talk about life groups. No, we're not. Typically, we do talk about life groups with this value because we love this idea, this New Testament picture of koinonia, of, of, of fellowship together, this community, and we love that. But being better together means more than just sharing a meal and, and sharing life. There's, there's more to it. And I think Jesus in this passage teaches us this, and I'm praying that we can unpack it in the time we have left together today. But he gets the disciples together and he goes, hey, I need to share with you what's about to happen. My time, my time is drawn to an end. And so it was important for me to get around the table with you guys, for just us to, to kind of come around the table. And the Bible actually says in Luke that they reclined at the table together. So it wouldn't have been like your last supper photos where they're all facing the camera sitting at a table. It's not how they did it, Okay. It would have been a flat table. They would have sat on the ground and they, they would have reclined. It would have been very casual and they would have ate and they would have talked. They would have ate and they would have talked and Jesus was there having this moment with them. And he said, I need, I need you to understand the weight of what's going to happen. And I need you to understand the weight because I'm about to ask you to change your mindset on some things. That's what Jesus was telling the disciples. See, because Passover was common. The Jewish people knew Passover. It was, it was common. It was, the, it was the moment we celebrated the, the blood on the doorpost from Moses' day and, and from being set free from Egypt. It was the day we celebrated the spotless lamb that, that would cover our sins and it would cause the, the, the punishment to pass over us. So they were familiar with this, but Jesus said, I'm going to, I'm going to need to change your mindset a little bit about this night. So it's going to be kind of heavy. And so I need you to kind of prepare your hearts. And so people, I'm going to, I'm going to give you just a, a second here. And I want to make sure you're aware. We have, we have four tables up front, two over here, two over here. There are also four tables in the back of the building. 
We want to try to make this as quick as possible this morning. What I'm going to ask you to do, if you're here this morning and, and you plan on taking communion with us here in just a second, I'm going to excuse you to go get your communion and come back to your seat. You say, Pastor Vince, I'm just a guest here. We, this isn't our home church. Well, let me clarify. Real life church, we practice what's called open communion. In other words, if you are here and you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you are here and you have accepted him and this great gift of salvation, and he is your redeemer and your restorer, and you know that you are his and he is yours, then this table is open for you. You are welcome here. There's no need for membership. I figure we might as well get used to it. We're going to celebrate for eternity together. Amen. Amen. And so at this point, I'm going to just release you, kind of excuse you. Can, you can come to the front, go to the back, but take just a moment. And if you would, let's prepare together to take communion. And so at this time, if you would, go ahead and get your communion. Once you get to your seat, if you'll just hang on to that for a second, we'll walk through it together. If, there, if we ran out on one side, I think there are still some over on the other tables available. He said, don't rush. So Jesus comes to the disciples and this night, this is how it says, it says, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and he said to the apostles with him, he said, I have so desired, I've earnestly desired to eat this meal with you. I, I, I've been waiting for this moment, fellas, before I suffer. For I tell you, I'm not gonna eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he took a cup, when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I, I won't be taking this with you. I won't drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And we pick up in verse 19, and I want you to kind of lean in. I know some of you have been in communion services your whole lives, and you've, you've heard these passages. I want, I want you to lean into just a couple words where Jesus really teaches us this idea that serving requires sacrifice. That serving requires sacrifice from us. Jesus gets the disciples and they've taken the bread and they have that in front of them and they've passed their cup to where each one of them is poured and, and it says this, and he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. In the other gospel it says, which is broken for you. My body for you. Me for you. Take it. When you take it, take it remembering that. Remembering what, Pastor Vince? Remembering that this is Jesus going, I'm giving myself on your behalf. And so, Father, I ask as we prepare to take the bread, 
that we as your people would hear the words of Jesus in our own hearts and we would be challenged to give ourselves even to the point of broken for others. And we would hear your voice. And so, Father, we take this bread at this moment, at this moment, remembering you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take the bread. He quickly moves into the cup, and the wording is a little different. And he's, this is where he's starting to try to get them to change their mindset because they understand the idea of a drink offering. A drink offering was one that would be poured out on behalf of, offered up unto God. A drink offering would have been an offering for sin. It would have been an offering for, for this, this idea of what the blood on the blood post meant. It was a passing over. I'm pouring this out so that the punishment passes over me and the grace of God is there. And so he moves after the bread and they've taken the bread and he said, in this cup, likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, he said, this cup is poured out for you. It's, it's my blood of the new covenant. It's, it's the promise of something greater that I'm pouring out for you, mine for you. So that part's familiar. And so, Father, as we come to you today, as we take this cup in our hands and we recognize that the blood spilled on Calvary, the sacrifice that was made on that day, God, matters so much because it was only that blood that was worthy. It was only that blood that was enough. And so thank you for the promise of your blood. Thank you for the promise and the power in your blood, God, that we could be redeemed and that you would pour it out so freely so that, so that I might receive you. And so, Father, we take this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Take the cup. So, Father, I thank you for this opportunity to partake in communion today. I thank you for the ability to come together as brothers and sisters. Whether we all be from this house or different houses, God, we are yours. And that's what matters. So, Father, I pray that you'd begin to still, you'd still be moving and preparing in our heart what you'd need us to hear today. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, that's a little different, but I feel like it really sets up where I want to go in talking about this idea of being better together and about this idea of serving Christ in whatever context that he calls us to serve him in. And I, and I understand serving is a lot, of, a lot of people struggle with it. I'm going to be unapologetic in it because I believe that we are never more like Jesus than when we serve. He just stated this in the passage that, I, that I'm doing this for you, my body for you, my blood for you. It's it's me doing this for you. And so when, when you, if you're taking notes today, that's that first point that I, you have to land in the reality that serving requires sacrifice. And we see Jesus do this throughout his ministry. There are so many times where Jesus is in ready, getting ready to preach somewhere or speak somewhere, and the kids all run up to him, and the disciples are like, no, 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 no. And he's like, hold up. Hold up, it's fine. Let them come on. Let them come on. No, I, got, I know I got other things to do, but I'm going to sacrifice that moment for this moment because I don't want to miss this moment. We see that where Jesus is legitimately, there's one of my favorite stories, is Jesus is on his way to a home to heal somebody. And in the crowd, a woman pushes through the crowd and touches just the hem of his garment. How many know the story I'm talking about? See, he wasn't there to heal that woman. He was heading someplace else, but she got through and she touched him and he sacrificed the pace of this moment to the point that if you keep reading, when he gets there, the, the girl's dead. But he stops to handle this moment. Why? Because when you serve people, it requires sacrifice. It's going to require something of you. There's no, very few people ever get to serve off the top. 
Most people have to dig into their world in order to serve. They got to get some of them out of the way in order to be able to offer it to somebody else. And so serving requires sacrifice. And so I want you to just kind of have that as the bedrock thought as we dive into the rest of this, because I believe that we're better together. I believe it's not just a thing that we say here at Real Life Church. I know. I know. Guys, listen, there's only one or two things that I do great, that I, that I do great, that I feel like God has called me to do. And there are about a million things that have to happen at Real Life Church for all of this to work. And I don't do them all. I, I cannot. If I was in that room running all the stuff that makes all of this stuff happen, somebody would have a seizure. Because there'd be lights going everywhere and words on the screen and some words not on the screen. And about the time that the preacher started walking this way, you notice how he just starts going with me? Not me. I'd be like, oh, crap. And I'd, I'd be behind. I'd miss it. You'd be just, your head would hurt. I cannot do some of those things. And so I know that it takes a lot of people sacrificing their time to do this, to be involved, to, to, to give. And so I need you to understand, I'm not going to be, well, I, if you want, no, no, listen, I believe as believers, we sometimes miss the reality of serving. And I'm going to show you here in scripture, but I, I hear people, well, let me pray about helping out. I think there are some things in the Christian walk you don't have to pray about. You ain't got to pray about it. I, people, well, you know, I've been praying about reading my Bible more. You ain't got to pray about that. Just do it. Just read more. You know, I've been praying about talking to my neighbor about Jesus. You don't have to pray about that. Tell him about Jesus. And so when, when we start, this is what we do with serving. You go, Pastor Vince, I'm really busy. Oh, we're about to get to that in a second. I understand. It's a crazy world we live in. When we start to say, God, I can serve you when this happens, we start to flesh out the context of what Christianity is based on my filter and your filter, rather than what Jesus defined as Christianity in his word. The Bible says that we are saved unto good works. Your salvation is not just for heaven. In fact, I would wonder, and maybe sometimes we have to stop and ponder this question, what if heaven wasn't the reward for salvation? What if just a life knowing Jesus was walking with you was the reward? Would it be enough? That's about the, about the volume that it's been in every other service that I've mentioned that. Because, I mean, gee, I, mean I, love, I love the fact, I mean, I'll be the first to tell you, I don't want to go to hell. Good news, I ain't. Okay? I'm not going. But I also know that I don't think I could live this life not having Jesus. And I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's just as important to me. Because I can't do tomorrow without him. So I wonder sometimes when we start to build this context of, well, I'm, I, yeah, I'm a Christian. I have Jesus in my life, but this is what it looks like for me. We have to be very careful defining what it looks like for us rather than letting the word define what it is. Okay? Serving takes sacrifice. And we struggle with that because we're just like the disciples. Just look at your neighbor and go, you're just like a disciple. No, I need you to, hey, hey, get with me. We ain't even started yet today. Look at the person next to you and say, hey, you're just like a disciple. Listen, these disciples, man, they just had this moment, which we understand we're, we're looking back at a moment. And so we can understand the weight of Jesus at the Last Supper, breaking bread, pouring wine. We understand the weight of that moment. The disciples in that moment, I'm going to give them a little bit of slack on it. They didn't quite, didn't quite understand the full weight of what Jesus was trying to tell them. And we know that's true because immediately following this powerful moment of Jesus breaking bread and pouring wine, they acted like us. This is what it says, Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 24. Now, a dis now, verse 20 is where Jesus says this. 
This is the cup poured out for you because of the new covenant in my blood. That's a pretty powerful statement, right? Four verses later, a dispute also arose among the disciples as to which of them would be regarded as the greatest. How did we get here? How do you go from Jesus having this moment of this is being vulnerable and this is me giving you the, the gospel, the blood and the body and, and the disciples are like, that's awesome. Where am I going to sit? No, I mean, really, like we've been talking about it and Peter and John are arguing about where they're going to sit because Peter's like, it's got to be me. Like I'm going to be, I got to be the greatest. Why you got to be the greatest? Because it's, I mean, I'm Peter. Like, I, I mean, I don't know if y'all remember, but we, I walked on the water. <laughs> like, you, you guys were there. You were in the boat, chickens, in the boat, sitting there in the boat. Here, I'm walking in the water. I'm strutting out there in the water, and John's like, you didn't strut, you sank. <laughs> what are you talking about, Peter? You didn't walk on the water. You act like you're square dancing out there. You was freaking out, Peter. We saw you freaking out. And if Jesus hadn't scooped you up, you'd be at the bottom of that sea right now. What are you talking about? You're the greatest one. John going, we all know it's me. Why do we know it's you, John? Because I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. How do you know? Because I wrote it about myself 47 times <laughs> in my gospel. Somebody said, how come it's not written in the other, the other gospels? Because those disciples were sick of hearing it from John. She's so like, we're not putting it in there. We're not putting that in there. John's got to be me. James is like, look, I don't know if it's Peter or John. I'm saying I got a shot. Why do you got a shot? Because my mom came and asked. J James and John's mom rolled right up to Jesus and said, like, my boys are good boys. If you could just find a seat for them, that'd be good. Like, I just, if they could sit close to you, Jesus. How many of you are overbearing parents? Hands up. <laughs> not today. I'm coming for you, but not today, all right? We're not ready for that sermon yet. And these disciples are just having this moment. Do you know why they're having this moment? Same reason you and I have the moment now and today in our life. It's because the world has convinced us that we need to be better than rather than better for. See, we, we get hung up in this. So long as I'm doing better than the person next to me, then God will see that. He'll recognize my better than. And God is saying, it doesn't matter to me whether you're doing better than the person next to you. Are you attempting to do better for me and the kingdom? That's who we should be. That's the service mentality. But we, we don't do that. We stack serving up with an ROI. Y'all know what ROI is, right? Return on investment. We put our serving in that category. So what's in it for me? Like, I'm willing to serve, but, like, if I serve, what does that mean? It means you're serving. I know, but, like, what does that mean? It means I'm going to need you to be involved. Yeah, but what does that mean? You want me to be straight with you? Yeah, Pastor Vince, bring it straight. What it means is I may need you to sacrifice a trip to TJ Maxx and give that time to the kingdom. What it may mean is I need you to sacrifice an hour or two of binge watching something and giving that time to the kingdom. I'm not asking you to do anything crazy. Some of this, I'm just going to blame on my culture, my culture. See, I grew up in church, and I grew up with Miss Wanda teaching Sunday school, and Miss Jackie, Grandma Jackie is what she ended up being called. So my grandparents lived about 12 hours away from us, so anybody with gray hair became a grandparent to me. <laughs> and now I have gray hair. <laughs> but that was who I grew up with. And Miss Wanda, she'd be sitting in there, and I grew up with flannel graph Jesus. Come on, somebody. Anybody flannel graph people? How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about at all? Hands up. Okay, all right. Well, let me school you in the ways of the world. Flannel graph was a board that basically had just material on it. We're going to call it flannel. Okay. But then they had these little people that you cut out or they popped out of the Sunday school book and they had little yellow lines on it that if you attach it to the flannel, it would stick to the board. And that's how the Sunday school teachers would tell the story. They just move it. Man, you have little Moses in the bull rushes 
in the, and there, and then the Nile River and flannel graph Jesus and David and Goliath and all those stories. And then we would go in after the class and move the people around. So Moses was fighting the giant and David was in the bulrushes and it was awesome. But, but I that's, but every Sunday, every Sunday, I hope you heard me every Sunday. They showed up. Vince, you telling me every, I don't get to tell you what to do, and please don't hear me doing that. I don't, I don't have permission to do that, nor would I ever, ever use this platform as that. What I'm telling you is that there was a level of commitment there that wasn't about them. It was about what they would see done in me. You see, it wasn't them showing up to get the pat on the back or the teacher of the year award in Sunday school. We didn't do that. They showed up to be better for the kingdom so that the person coming out of that class could go be better for the kingdom so that, so that one day in 2024, there'd be a gray-haired, bald preacher running around on this stage trying to tell you that there is a Jesus that's worth committing to and for. Amen. Not for, not so that, man, a few weeks ago is after Easter. And let me just tell you, can I let you all in a little church secret? Pastors turn silly around Easter time. We do. I'm gonna throw myself in the pot there. First question, you get on the phone with the pastor? First question. So how many did you have? Oh, we had a bunch. Yeah, I know, but how, I mean, how many? I don't know. I had several decisions for Christ. Yeah, how, what was the attendance number? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. No, it does matter. I'm curious. What was it? How many salvations? How many baptisms? How many? 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 Going, look, if I can take, if I can take you from here to here, and that's the way God wants you to go, all of heaven rejoices. Okay? That, that's who we ought to be. But we have, we have got to get to this place where serving is greater than self, and the disciples missed it. They just had this moment where Jesus basically says, I'm going to serve you by sacrificing everything, and they immediately slid into a conversation that said, who gets the best seat? And Jesus said, you're missing it. You're, you've, you've missed what I'm asking, what, I, what I'm trying to show you, what I'm trying to inform you of, that there's a greater thing at stake here that the world so desperately needs to see. Because I don't think the world needs to be impressed by another whatever. I, I just want to make sure that what I'm doing is pleasing the Father, and if I'm pleasing the Father, he'll take care of me. I don't need, I don't need the next biggest church. I don't need, but I'm going to keep being, I'm going to keep working my tail off to be the best preacher I can possibly be so that you all are impressed. No, absolutely not. But so that one more person who's not in this room yet might hear about Jesus Christ. I will serve that way. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with him? I know the, the reality of self is that we've been trained to, to find the return on our investment. I, I, what am I getting out of this? What, I mean, I should be getting something like, what's the blessing? What, what's, what's, what's the return? And we, we don't think about it. We, we, we just naturally fall that way. But then, like, if you flip that conversation and put it on Jesus... You imagine him on the cross looking to God and going, hey, God, what am I going to get out of the people that I do this for? Like, what's going to be the return on my investment? We go, no, 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 that's not. Jesus just loves us. He just loves us. That's not how he thinks. That's not how he's wired. He doesn't do that. And yet you and I are called Christians. Little Christ. Can we set the return aside and just trust God with it? And just serve. Yeah, but Pastor Vince, how? Somehow, some way, just get involved. You might be surprised. 
We see Jesus as he's looking. How many of you are facial expression people? When somebody does something silly, you can't help yourself? How many of you are married to one of those people? Okay, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? We're like, somebody says something there, you're like. I feel like this moment happened. It had to have happened in the upper room where Jesus is pouring his guts out about the sacrifice and the, and the cross and, and my body being broken and the blood being poured out for you. And then Peter's like, yeah, but who gets the best seat? What? Sit. Yeah, I was wondering the same thing, Jesus. Um, I mean... I know I don't have a lot of stories in the Bible. This was Bartholomew talking because, like, nobody knows Bartholomew. So he's just hoping for a little bit of play. Can I just get some action here, Jesus? Where they all know Peter and John. They're going to get those stories, but nobody's got a Bart story. Can we get a Bart story? Jesus is going, what in the world? John, you don't get this in any of the synoptic gospels, so not Matthew, Mark, or Luke, but in John chapter 13. It's interesting, you don't, get, you don't get the Last Supper details in John. But you get these details in John. It says, in, <clears throat> in supper being ended, and God having put on the heart of Jesus that he delivered all things to his hands. In other words, that which I came from, I'm going to. And it's finished. I've, I've done the work. I've taught the lessons. I've shared the stories. I've, they've seen that I am God. They, they, they have enough information now to go tell the story. He gets up from dinner. He walks over to the doorway. And I'm sure the disciples were confused at this time. He walks over to the doorway. He grabs the towel. Now, talk about making some faces. Because there would have been an upper room and the stairwell would have came in from the outside. It wasn't interior home stairs like we have now. The sta- you would have had to go outside to get up into the upper room. And so people were coming from street level into the upper room. And so there would have been a basin by the door. There would have been a pitcher and a water basin and a towel, and there would have been a servant there and whose job was the worst. His job was that you walked all day in sandals in a dirty, filthy street of Jerusalem during Passover where who knows what is in the street. And his job is no matter who you are, I'm gonna bend down and I'm gonna wash everything off your feet. And Jesus said, fellas, the Gentiles, and I think this was a little bit of a jab. He's like, the Gentiles think like you think. Because they, they place themselves in authority, and then they call themselves benefactors. They call themselves the boss. Because they have the right seat. But not so for you. This is not the case for you. For who do you think is the greatest? Is it the one who reclines at the table? And notice they're all reclining at the table. Is it the one who reclines at the table or is it the servant? In fact, I would tell you that you at the table need to get your mind in a place where the greatest among you becomes the youngest. And the word youngest there is right. You say, yeah, you mean least. No, he meant the youngest. They would have been the least respected. They would have been the one given the least amount of responsibility. Why? Because they didn't have enough years to be considered helpful. He said, I I want you to take your mind back to that place of humility and not be the one reclining at the table. In fact, I don't even want you to be the king or the benefactor. He goes and gets the towel. I want you to be the servant. And then the Bible blows our mind. Because it says, 
he gird himself with the towel. Simple, he just would have wrapped it around him to where a portion of the towel would have held between here. And it says he began to wash the disciples' feet. Bartholomew, I know. I know you think nobody knows your name. But I do. As he pours the water over his dirty feet, washes them and dries them. James, you've been a good disciple. He washes his feet. Simon, not Peter, the other Simon. Gets over in front of Peter, and Peter, Peter does what Peter does. No, 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 uh-uh. Jesus, you are not, you are not washing my feet. Christians, I want you to get this, get this. Peter, no, Jesus, you can't, you, I cannot let you wash my feet, Jesus. I mean, no, I'll wash yours, but no. And Jesus said, if you don't get this part, then you don't understand any of it. In fact, Jesus' words said, if you don't understand this part, I have no part with you. Some of you are wondering how to be the best preacher. Some of you are wondering how to be the best worship singer. Some of you are wondering how to be the best at anything. And Jesus said, none of that matters if you don't figure out the towel. If you don't figure out the towel, all of that will go away. There's going to come a day when I don't preach, when I can't preach, when my mind isn't working and I can't put the words together and nobody's showing up to hear Pastor Vince make them laugh or cry. But I'm going to tell you, there is a king in my life that taught me the towel. And I can do this from the day Jesus did it in his last day with people. He didn't spend all night giving them this amazing sermon. He said, learn the towel. If you don't learn the towel, nobody will, it won't matter. The world doesn't need another amazing sermon. They've heard them. They need Christians that will pick up the towel. Serve. See, this is, it's not just that serving is a sacrifice, or it's not just that serving is greater than self. Serving is the way of our Savior. It is what He, they call Him the suffering servant. My, my body for yours. My blood in place of yours. Hey, Donnie, cast your cares upon me. Why, Jesus? Why? Because I care for you. And I know the load you're carrying, and you can't. So take mine. Why? Because my burden is easy. And my yoke is light. I don't know how to do that. It's okay. I'll serve you. I'll serve you. You want to change the world with the gospel? Pick up a towel. I walk through this building all week long and I see people show up and they'll come in on Thursdays, sweep floors, pick up your coffee cups and all those things during the week. Please don't take that as a shot. I'm not, leave your coffee cup. You're not bothering me. They show up and they serve and they'll come in here and they'll make sure we got worship music playing and they're pushing a broom through the chairs and they're wiping up a coffee or a tea spill and they're singing. And I'll throw up my hands again and again, giving gratitude to God. Why? Because they're carrying a towel. 
And I see our team walk through trying to figure out how to, how to find one more person to sit in a children's room so that somebody, so that my kid has a Miss Wanda or a Grandma Jackie that in 40 years they can look back on and go, if it wasn't for them, I might not have known Jesus. And every week that children's worker picks up a towel. I wonder in your life, what have you done with this Jesus? Have you just been trying to make sure he stays happy? Because if you miss this, if you miss this, you may miss it all. Those aren't my words. It's his words. And Peter goes, no, 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 I don't want to miss it all. Jesus, I don't care if it's feet water. You wash my head and my hands and my back and whatever you, I'll take, I'll take the feet water. Bring it on. Don't be the one that has to be convinced of it. Be the one that just follows and does it. Be the one that understands you don't have to pray about this. You, 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 don't, have to, you don't have to pray about it. You step into it. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, and then I promise I'm going to let you go. I hear people all the time, so Pastor Vince, I just wish I knew what to do. I just wish I knew God's call in my life. I just wish I knew what God wanted me to do. Samuel is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Samuel's this young preacher, and, the, and his mom said, Lord, I'm going to give him back to you. And she gives him back to the temple. And chapter 3 of Samuel, I believe it's 1 Samuel, he's, he's asleep. And God wakes him up in the middle of the night and says, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel gets up, runs into Eli, who's the prophet. He says, hey, master, you called. Eli said, I ain't call you. I ain't call you. A couple more times that happens, and Eli finally catches it, and he says, now, Samuel, if you hear the voice again, I want you to say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Your what? Servant is listening. Okay. Sure enough, God shows up. Samuel, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And God begins to tell Samuel all that he would do in his life. That's not my favorite part. That's the cool part of the story. My favorite part of the story is chapter 3, verse 1. Because in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And Samuel was ministering daily in the house of the Lord. You know what that means? It means he was in a position to hear from God, not waiting to hear from God to get in a position. I wonder in your life, what have you done with this Jesus? What will you do with this Jesus? There are opportunity and there are needs everywhere. Here at Real Life Church, the Reed Center, other organizations, your neighbors, your coworkers, your schoolmates, there is opportunity to carry a towel. Don't miss it. Today as you leave, I'm going to ask you to just bow with me if you would. Today as you leave, I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to call you out. When you leave today at the counter, there's opportunities to serve. There's opportunities to get on the on-ramp to find out what and where God can utilize the gifts and the talents he has given you. Not just here, wherever. But God, I'm not going to sit and hope you pour it out. I'm going to show up. I'm going to step in. I'm going to get in. I'm going to pick up the towel. God, make us a people. Make us a people, God, that in the morning, that when we pray for boldness, we set it aside for the prayer. God, help us today to pick up the towel. Help us to serve a broken world today so that they see Jesus in us. That's what the world needs. So God, help us to pick up the towel. And we'll give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.